Hello friends and family and welcome to our October, October, <laughs> I'm going to leave that in, October 26th edition of our boring meditation stuff. Um, this is the third video on hallucination and I've been uh, kind of cherry picking neuroscientists, um, but today I wanted to talk about V.S. Ramachandran. Um, and uh, not specifically about his book, um, Phantoms in the Brain, but um, he has done some interesting work around um, phantom limbs, which is uh, people who have uh, a limb severed and uh, they feel as though the limb um, is still there and uh, the sort of reverse, which is that uh, there is a condition where people feel that a limb of their own um, is not their own, that the, their right arm is, <laughs> it's not theirs, it doesn't belong to them, and um, that they really wanna get rid of it. And there are a number of those people who have actually had surgeries to remove a perfectly healthy limb um, to gain some sanity from this uh, constant creeping feeling that there's a part of their body that doesn't belong to them. And in uh, Ramachandran's research with respect to uh, these sorts of conditions um, and sorts of situations, um, there there is work done. Uh, in particular, I think he's uh, quite famous for using uh, a mirror and having those with a phantom limb move, move the phantom limb while they move the actual limb they still have, usually the other arm, um, within the, the visual space of the, the mirror. And if they move them both together, um, they get the sense that there is actually a real limb on the other side and that they can get control of it. Um, the interesting component here in um, the, the talks that I've seen Ramachandran do and his writing um, is a sort of uh, a sort of intersection between belief about our own body, so that we can believe things um, which are true or not true about our own body, so that my right arm doesn't actually belong to me. This is someone else's right arm, and I would rather cut off my arm than have it as, as a tool, as an appendage I can make use of. Or that um, the, the arm that I've lost is still there um, and that it is in an uncomfortable position. So this is often a uh, difficulty with the phantom limb that um, the hand is bent in a position that is um, sometimes physically impossible, but almost certainly painful. So the person is experiencing pain of the phantom limb all the time and that they want relief from that. And that if they believe they're seeing the phantom limb in the mirror, um, correct itself, that they can mentally unwind um, this broken relationship they have with a body part that's not even there in actuality. And uh, if you see one of Ramachandran's talks, he often goes through um, the... Uh, there's a, a homunculus on the cortex of the brain, and so kind of covers <laughs> across the brain right here um, it's almost like a uh, like a headphone band a across more or less the center of the brain and along that uh, chunk of the cortex uh, is a homunculus in the sense that each piece sort of corresponds to different parts of the body and that within the brain um, the different components of the physical structure are interacting with one another and interacting with the um, internals of the brain in different ways. 
obviously positioned in different parts of the brain, adjacent to something which is not actually physically adjacent on the body. Um, so one uh, a very strong example would be uh, that of the hands and feet. So the hands and feet actually contain um, a great deal more significance in terms of how they interact with the homunculus um, or how the brain interprets messages from those parts of the body. So the hands and feet, it, there is a, a sort of there's a little um, statue, uh, figurine, of the significance homunculus, <laughs> where the body is <laughs> the body is very very tiny and the the limbs are quite thin, but then the hands are huge and the feet are huge and the head is quite huge, and the genitalia are huge, and of course the genitalia are um, directly adjacent to uh, in particular the feet but hands and feet and so you have this sort of association physical association between sexuality and um, I mean, uh, in, in uh, the case of feet feet which is of course where you get um, sorts of uh, fetishization of different parts of the body and things like that um, is almost certainly due to these adjacencies. Um, what is interesting about this is that uh, you can see how, okay, this homunculus exists and it's part of the cortex of the brain and it's interacting with other parts of the brain. So that's one direction, right, where the external sense bases, particularly touch, in the case of like a physical homunculus, touch is working its way through to the brain. So uh, I touch something with some part of my body, then there is this uh, electrical impulse, it travels through the nervous system, it's processed by the brain, it works its way through the homunculus, and then it relates to all sorts of other things going on in the brain. Um, the brain is, is important for um, thought and emotional processing and all sorts of other things making as uh, the last two videos have stated um, hallucinating our consciousness for us making a coherent image of the world and um, it sort of stands to reason it makes sense that you can go in the other direction um, so uh, you begin with working uh, on sensory input coming into the brain. And um, Vipassana meditation is essentially working in the reverse. So you're saying, okay, ignore sensory input, and I'm going to use the brain, use conscious awareness to uh, take control of sensory input. Um, the control is not active, it's just observational. So you are using conscious awareness to probe all these different parts of the body. You can, it seems as though you're sort of making a journey throughout the body with your attention, um, but in effect, you're also walking <laughs> this homunculus in your brain. Um, not in that order, of course. <laughs> Jumping all over the place because the order is not the same externally and internally. Um, but uh, it's interesting to think about the correlations there, even at a very gross uh, neuroscientific, um, neuroscientific level, um, where neuroscience says, oh, okay, the brain and the body are connected in such and such a way, that if I use the body as a meditation object, systematically, I work my way through the body, I go through every part and I work my way back. <laughs> I'm going through every part. Um, again, it's boring and painstaking, um, but it becomes fascinating over time um, because of these adjacencies that you start to sort of uncover in this process, this direct process of exploring the brain 
through the body, um, at least at a high level. And then a person starts to explore the subtler aspects of their own mind where um, maybe the brain is not all that involved even, potentially. Um, but uh, personally, I find this to be an, an interesting sort of rational basis for bothering with the exploration in the first place. Oh, okay, yeah, all these things have to do with each other. That makes sense. Um, and neuroscience says so, and psychology says so. So let's dig around and, and see what we can do without, you know, we don't need an fMRI machine at home. <laughs> we can just explore this connection between the brain and the body directly. Um, again, all of this begins with anapana meditation. So this part of the body is no less connected than any other part, and you have fairly concrete, finite control over your exploration of that part of the body. So it takes a lot of practice to get to the point where you can say, oh, okay, I have like attuned, <laughs> I have focused my attention. An fMRI machine doesn't get distracted, right? So an fMRI machine will <laughs> slice up your brain for you, um, figuratively speaking, um, with a 3D image. And at no point does it, oh, sorry, I was thinking about the football season. <laughs> The fMRI machine doesn't uh, doesn't particularly care about anything else and only has this one job to do and it does it fairly diligently. Um, but it only has uh, a certain resolution. It can only work so fast and it's fairly expensive. Um, by contrast, uh, it's a lot more work for us to get this continuous focus. Um, but once we have it, then we can explore this same thing ourselves. Uh, and it would all be it a completely different way. But um, this is the way that we learn to do that, is anapana meditation, to keep bringing our attention back so that we become a sort of uh, <laughs> meat-based fMRI machine, um, self-referential fMRI machine uh, for our own brain, and we can see what's going on in there. Um, so this is, this is perhaps a longer road to walk than the previous two hallucination talks and, and maybe it's a bit inaccessible. Um, if anyone has questions about that, I'm happy to answer them uh, to talk about uh, what I mean by any of this and why it all seems related to me if that explanation was insufficient. In the meantime, I hope you're all taking good care of yourselves and taking good care of each other and I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.